Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the weekly market analysis for the week ending October 20th, 2023. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Uh, and you can also find me on Twitter at Mr. J. Thomason, and you can follow my newsletter at BeFinanciallyFree.Substack.com. The links to both of those are in the description below. And as we jump into the markets today, um, I'm going to present to you uh, the bearish argument here. I'm going to explain why I think that the next week or two could be a really dangerous time for risk assets and the situation is set up for something like a crash to take place. And I don't even like to use the word crash uh, because I, I, it's not about getting clicks and I'm not trying to fear monger in any way, I'm not trying to start panic, but I do think that there are a lot of things that are lining up in such a way uh, that, um, that we should be concerned as investors. So I think I'll start with the bullish argument first uh, because there's less to talk about with the bullish argument. So what are some things that could be bullish about the markets today? So here I'm looking at the S&P 500. Uh, now, frankly, I don't see anything bullish here other than, you know, you could make the case that we're at a level of support uh, that we might, uh, that might hold. Uh, a couple of things. Um, the Russell, this could be a fake breakout. Uh, I could make the case that, uh, that this is the same uh, pattern but uh, reversed as what we saw back in 2020. One, so you can see here I've got this sideways channel, uh, kind of like a, a triangle that is like slowly tightening over time. Uh, it's worked out pretty well, and then we finally got a breakdown, a retest, and a resumption down. Um, and uh, it and this this could be a fake, and the reason why is because if I compare it back to uh, 2021, like I was saying, uh, I could put up a. Uh, let me just do the trend lines really quick. Uh, this is actually something if you followed my videos uh, over the course of last year, you actually saw me doing this in real time. Uh, and so let me just, I'm just going to kind of put a random line. Uh, so this is what I was tracking all of last year. You could go back on the history of my videos and basically from like May and June through the end of the year, I was talking about how this was concerning to me that the Russell was going sideways for all this time. So similar thing, a little bit of a tighter range. Uh, it was shorter. This is about 10 months worth of time that this was happening. Uh, we got a break out to the upside right around the time that the NASDAQ was making its intraday highs uh, or its, its highs for the year, new all-time highs. Um, uh, it's at the time that Bitcoin made its uh, price peak. Uh, and then, of course, it all fell down after that, broke back down into the channel, bounced a little bit, and then broke down. And then, of course, the rest was history uh, into 2022. Uh, so I could make the case, potentially, that this is the same thing but to the other direction. Uh, just like back in 2021, there was a lot of euphoria in November of 2021 uh, after the Russell had been sideways and all the markets were moving up at that particular time. Uh, in this case, after having moved sideways for a considerable amount of time, the Russell is is moving down. There's a lot of pessimism in the markets. There's a lot of worry and concern in the markets. Uh, and people are wondering if there's going to be anybody that ever buys the Russell again, I guess. Uh, so it could, maybe this could reverse to the upside and do, uh, do something like, you know, like maybe we break back up into the channel, bounce, 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 and then like go back up. And then finally we break out and it's bullish. So you can make the case there. Uh, so that's one argument you could make. Uh, another one that you could make is the Dow. Uh, the Dow positioning is extremely bearish. It actually has been just getting progressively more bearish according to the CFTC data. Um, and, uh, and it's entirely possible that uh, the positioning in the Dow is set up in such a way where uh, if we have a, you know, a news failure event or some sort of intraday price reversal, uh, that it could start having people cover those shorts and, and we could you know start rocketing off to the upside. Uh, so that's possible. Um, another thing that you can you know you could talk about is the sentiment. Uh, I mean, you go on CNBC uh, and everyone's talking about uh, how you know they saw this coming. The yields are gonna you know bond yields are gonna just go up and up and up and up. Uh, you know, people were talking about Tesla after it's, I think I, I, I heard on CNBC, what, yesterday or the day before, I think on uh, Wednesday or yesterday about 
how you know Tesla dropped nine percent because of its earnings and uh, the guy on CNBC was saying oh like it's still too expensive I wouldn't buy it here um, you know it needs to go down further so there's like there's some sentiment stuff out there that you know could make you think oh now would be a great time to buy I mean everyone is kind of in a panic mode with what's going on geopolitically uh, everyone is um, you know talking about escalation uh, everyone's talking about fears relating to the oil market and all that uh, sovereign debt issues so we've got a lot of things that are causing a lot of negativity and usually when everyone is negative then that means that price is likely to go the other direction so honestly those are the only arguments the Russell could be making a fake breakdown Dow positioning is favorable to, for the long side uh, as far as risk reward is concerned and the sentiment isn't too great but that's about it uh, to be honest with you uh, so now I'm going to take time to go through the bearish argument and I've got quite a bit here that we could talk about um, and I'll start with the S&P 500 let me just I'll try to take this index by index and then uh, and then we'll look at a couple of other things so uh, on the S&P 500, we have a breakdown from this trend line that has been holding, uh, basically uh, connecting the October lows from uh, the March lows of this year. Uh, price finally, after all this time, got back down and touched it at the beginning of this month, bounced, got rejected by the tide line, and then we've come down and now made a lower closing low. Uh, we've also, you can also see here, we've got a pending tide cross. Uh, so next week. Uh, if, if price stays down at this level without bouncing significantly, we'll, we'll probably get a tide cross next week. Uh, bearish tide crosses are not good. Um, sometimes you get uh, occasionally get false signals, but more often than not, the bearish tide signal is a sign that things are not going to be very good. Uh, so we can point out a bunch of those kinds of situations uh, over the past. Um, but pending bearish tide cross, uh, the lower highs and lower lows uh, that have been established in this downtrend now, uh, that's bearish. Uh, the Russell, I was talking about the Russell in terms, maybe this is a, a maybe this is a fake breakout. Uh, we made new lows uh, compared to the 2022 lows. I think that's significant. Uh, and typically, you know, uh, when something makes new 52-week lows, uh, it's probably going to go further. Um, you know there are there are traders out there that will trade based on the on where things uh, you know if they break out from a 52 week high uh, then that's or break down from a 52 week low then that's the, you know some people take trades off of that um, and so I think that this is a signal that things could get a lot worse uh, we've got the Nasdaq if we go to the Nasdaq chart uh, the Nasdaq also made a new closing low although it didn't quite close in a, at a place where I I feel like you can really call it a lower low um, because we got a bunch of wicks down at this level. Technically, if you think about the, you know, uh, maybe I should have talked about this in the in the bullish case, but uh, you know, according to the normal way that we th that I use the tide indicator here, um, this is typically a good place to buy. Um, so I will say that. However, the tide uh, space uh, between the the tide premium here between the control line and the tide line is shrinking. Um, and obviously the tide line has turned red and so that's uh, those are not a good signs we've got uh, we put in another lower high and it appears that we've confirmed that um, and so obviously that's not a good thing uh, either so the equity indices are technically not in a position uh, where we would say that they are uh, you know uh, where, where they're they don't look technically strong we'll put it that way uh, you know further uh, let me pull up really quick um, we've got, uh, you know, as far as overbought and oversold, um, you know, the Qs uh, are, are have a low RSI, but they're not oversold. Uh, SPY, S&P 500, uh, and the Russell, they're, they're weak, but they're not oversold, at least according to the RSI. Um, so uh, there's there's nothing here that would that should signal to you, oh, I should buy this right now at this moment, as, as far as like technical underlying indicators are concerned. So equity indices don't seem to suggest uh, anything positive. Um, we could also talk about, um, I use this indicator a lot, the stocks uh, above the 50-day moving average. Um, I, you know, back on uh, October 6th, on Friday the 6th in that video, I talked about how because of the close below the, the uh, extreme zone, um, that that was a high probability, I think 8% uh, probability of a winning trade. 
So I had taken that trade and wrote it up and uh, you know that was good but now it's on the way back down and you know there's still room for this to come down further uh, and there have been times in the past where uh, the indicator comes down below that level pops and then comes back down below it's happened on a number of occasions um, so it's entirely possible uh, and obviously when it drops down below there then that'll be an opportunity to play for a bounce possibly uh, but it'll be something you'll have to uh, look at with multiple other indicators um, you know if you look at the 200 day moving average breadth so stocks above their 200 day moving averages it's again making lower lows lower highs uh, trending downward so this and this has some room to go before it gets down to an extreme level uh, so uh, that's something to be aware of as well so uh, in terms of breadth it doesn't look super good um, uh, let's see, I wanted to look at a couple of indicators. Um, I look at the RSP versus the low volatility uh, as a gauge. And uh, while the tide on this is still bullish, I, I usually will use tide as an indicator on this. Uh, while tide is still technically bullish, uh, price is breaking down pretty significantly. It's trending down. Uh, you can actually see from uh, from basically back in July when we were peaking in the equity markets, that's when the momentum to the upside kind of started to wane you could see in the price action and then it started to sort of come down that's not good uh, one of the proxies that I use for risk is the high beta to low beta ratio uh, we're doing the same thing there, making new lows you can actually see we peaked um, you know in July and it's been coming off ever since and you know if if price doesn't bounce here we could get a tide cross next week or maybe possibly the week after uh, if this if this gets a tide cross, that would be very bad, um, according to like the way that I score in, uh, my indicators uh, and, uh, through some of my overlays that I use. That would not be a good uh, sign, as well as the uh, vol uh, the VVIX versus the VIX. Uh, if this stays down, um, we'll we'll get this uh, to cross as well. And then basically all of the major crosses that can be used to um, uh, to assess market risk uh, can be uh, will we'll all be bearish from that stand from the tide from the standpoint of the tide indicator uh, so that wouldn't be good as well um, and it's trending that way and I guess that's the thing I keep saying it wouldn't be good but it's trending that that's going to happen like that's the direction that things are moving uh, speaking of the volatility index uh, the VIX got a bullish tide cross and is over the 20 line um, and, you know, if I just pull it back a little bit to September of last year, we got a bullish uh, tide cross on the VIX really close to the, uh, the top in the VIX. And so I, I do want to acknowledge that the tide cross in itself doesn't necessarily have to mean that volatility is going to continue to spike up and that stocks are going to continue to go down. Because in this case, it was near the near the bottom of the equity markets and the top of the VIX spike there. Uh, but what I will say is, in general, like if you you could pull it back further, look at back in towards the end of November 2021, we got went right in the middle of uh, equities making all time highs. Uh, we had the uh, the VIX tide cross occur, and basically it stayed crossed until we got into you know the late into the third quarter of uh, 2022. Uh, when markets were getting ready to bottom um, and obviously we know that the equity indices dropped like 30 percent so uh, you know and you could go back further uh, we got like if I, I really like looking at Q4 2018 we got a tide cross on the VIX in mid-October and you know it still took two months after that for price to get down to 20 percent and for the VIX to reach its uh, its peak during that cycle above 35. So the VIX is is showing, you know, bad news right now for the for the markets. The move index, uh, the move index is is uh, has been spiking lately. Uh, it's about to get a bullish tide cross uh, going into next week. Um, that's not good. Equity investors, uh, though, this is about bond market volatility. Uh, uh, investors need to be concerned about um, uh, about there being uh, increases in bond market volatility. Uh, so that's something that you need to be concerned about. Uh, we could look at the credit spreads and there's no update on the credit spreads for today. They're only updated as of yesterday. Uh, but we had been spiking, kind of came off a little bit and we're back up to the levels that we uh, were at uh, two weeks ago. 
and uh, you know while we're still well below the high risk threshold uh, that's still uh, seeing this trend up is not good and and just like on the VIX and on the move index you're either you're, you're getting really close to uh, a bullish tide cross and that would uh, that would be bad news bears um, let me see. Let me look at my list really quick. Okay. Yeah. So the, those are like, I mean, that's a lot of things. It's a lot of stuff that points to uh, increasing volatility, downside in, in the markets. Uh, and, and there are some other things that I, that I think we need to be concerned about. One is outside of the Dow, the positioning in equity indices has actually gotten more bullish. I'm not saying that it, it's totally bullish, but it's more bullish than it was last week. Um, and so I think that that's something uh, that you need to take note of. That's something that, that I'm worried about. The other thing I'm, I'm concerned about is the yield. So I'll just go to the 10-year for now. Um, there are a lot of people talking about, I mean, first of all, I'll say, you know, people need to stop trying to pick peaks. People were picking the tops all along this run up. People were picking the top back in October of last year. People were picking the top in June of last year. People were picking the top, uh, you know, going back to March of 21 and so on. Uh, it's it's crazy. I, I feel like I'm I'm I mean I'm young enough or old enough, whichever one you want to call it, to remember how you know when we were back in March 2021, people and myself included, until I you know learned more and realized you know the the possibilities out there, like and not to discount anything. Uh, people were talking back here that yields couldn't go over two percent, and here we are, you know, 300 basis almost 300 basis points later, actually over 300 basis points later. So they can go up, right? And you know, if they go up, they're going to affect the interest rate parts of the of risk assets, the the interest sensitive, uh, interest rate sensitive risk assets. So that's the Nasdaq, right? Because you know, long duration tech, right? That's that's going to suffer if the yields, especially towards the long end of the yield curve, are or of the bond market, are are uh, are higher. Right, the Russell. I, I think part of the reason the Russell has done so horribly is because uh, a lot of the small cap indices, they, their debt situations are a lot different. Uh, they don't have as much cash coming through. They have to uh, they have to service their debt a lot more uh, frequently, uh, and they're a lot less. There's a lot less certainty in the servicing of their debt, so higher yields are bad for them too. Um, so uh, you could look at this two ways, right? Like, I mean, on the one hand, first of all, like let's let's assume for just a minute that this trend continues and the yields continue to go up well if the yields continue to go up that's going to put pressure on risk assets let's think about the other possibility let's think about you know let's imagine that finally at some point somebody like people are right all the bond bulls are right and they're like oh this is going to be the peak finally we could buy bonds why would bonds why would why would it be time to buy bonds like think about that either Either bonds are going to be bid because of a recession, which there is no rece recession in sight. And I could, I like, if we just look really briefly at uh, my business cycle, oops, business cycle indicators, um, all of the indicators used by the NBER, like, they're fine. There's nothing there indicating recession. If you want to look at GDP, uh, GDP is fine. GDI is fine. No recession there. Uh, if you want to look at, uh, you know, you want to look at uh, where are they? Uh, unemployment rate, it's fine. Uh, job openings and labor turnover survey, the job openings versus quits, it's fine. Uh, I mean, uh, really, it shows that the economy is hot as far as these go. Jobless claims, still low. Everything's fine, right? So all that is to say, like, there is no risk of recession in, in the, it, it's not imminent in the next, like, little bit. Like, what's going to deteriorate in the next, you know, week or two or three or four, that's going to mean, that's going to like start where the bond market's going to start pricing in recession. You know, it could take a couple more months for things to deteriorate, right? I mean, and then that, of course, you have to add in the inflation part. And there are a lot of people out there that are saying like, oh, bonds aren't going up because of inflation. Bonds are going up because, you know, nobody wants to buy the U.S. debt. And, and that may be true, but I'm just saying like, there's these fact, these are very real factors, right? So like, there's nothing that there's no nothing recessionary that's going to cause a bid in bonds. So the only other thing could would be a flight to safety, like meaning that the Fed is panicking and cutting rates. Uh, that that would be the situation where you would see the bid into bonds. And if the, and if the Fed is pivoting and cutting rates, well then we've got bigger problems, right? In which case, like 
tell me tell me one place like let, let me put the uh, let me put it like a monthly chart uh, of the S&P 500 uh, and then let me overlay it with the Fed funds rate I'm gonna just put it E I can't even do this right sorry EFFR um, right um, so sorry I gotta get this right pardon me right tell me like when the Fed starts cutting rates, like, I mean, it, it, they, they kind of went up a little bit further before the, the 2020 crash. But tell me, like, whenever the rates are, are coming down, like, tell me that that's good for, for, you know, the economy, right? Like, tell me that when the Fed starts panicking and cutting rates, that it's good for the stock market, right? Like, how, how much evidence do you need that the Fed panicking and cutting rates, like, everyone's clamoring, like, oh, like, like this gives the the Fed room to cut. This gives the Fed room to cut. Well, they're not going to cut unless something's wrong. And if something's wrong and they're cutting, the stock market's not going to go up. Okay? So I think that's something that you have to think about. So, like, I, it's almost like, I, and I don't want to, maybe I don't want to put this out there just because if I, now that if I say it, then exactly the opposite will happen. But, uh, but it's almost as if equities are in a no-win situation here. Because if yields continue to go up for, uh, at the levels and the rates that they're going up, it's going to hurt the markets. If the yields start coming down because the Fed's cutting, then, or if it's recession, then that's going to hurt equities too. So it's hard to it's hard to see, uh, you know, it's hard to see a situation uh, in the yield, like according to the yields, where things are going to materially improve. And you know where where think where where maybe the pressure will get taken off bonds in such a way that you know equities will be able to you know take off you know so I I, I don't know what you like I don't know what to tell you there I, it just doesn't to me it's it's not bullish to me that's not something that I would be clamoring for uh, so th those all the, all of what I just said are the reasons why I think it's high risk going into the next week or two. I'm thinking near term, like who knows what's going to happen two, three, four, five, six months from now or a year from now. But in near term, despite the selling that has taken place over the last week, uh, it, it, I, it's hard to be bullish. It's hard to be bullish here. Um, like there's a part of me that's bullish because there have been so many people all across 2023 that have wanted the markets to crash for so long. And there are a lot of those people that are uh, taking victory laps and jumping for joy. So there is a part of me that is bullish for that reason. But all of the signaling, all of the risk overlays, all of the quantitative analysis that I do in my research process tells me that there's nothing to be bullish about. So I wanted, so I, so I, I, I wanted to get that in there as well. So I know I talked about that for a while. And then for the last few minutes of this video, I'm going to talk about uh, what I'm seeing in gold and Bitcoin. So um, I just want to, let me just remind everybody first that back in April, I had talked about uh, when gold was over $2,000 an ounce, I had said gold was not going to make a new all-time high uh, in 2023. That that was going to be a 2024 story on the other side of recession. Uh, I also talked about how a bearish tide cross would be bad. And when we got that bearish tide cross, it was bad gold dumped in September, right? Now, what's happened since then? Two weeks ago, on Friday, October 6th, in, our, in the video, you can go check it, I talked about how gold was extremely oversold and that we got a reversal candle, uh, an intraday reversal candle. And so I suggested that gold's probably going to bounce. Now, this is before the Israel conflict. So, I, like, you can never know when those exogenous events will happen. But it was positioned like the and also the positioning like was relatively short. I, I wouldn't say it was extreme, but it was relatively short. And you know, so all of the the criteria was there f to get a squeeze in gold, right? I, I didn't know that there was going to be geopolitical conflict and that it was going to cause gold to go up almost ten percent in a span of two weeks. Like nobody could have foreseen that, right? So like. I have a problem with all of the all the gold bugs out there and all the people who have been bullish gold and wrong for be the better part of a year. Uh, I have a problem with everybody taking victory laps as if they knew what was going on and what was going to happen this whole time. Because the only reason gold is up right now is because they're because of the war. 
there's no there are no fundamental reasons other than panic and geopolitical flight to safety that would cause gold to be up as high as it is right now uh, and, and I'll explain why in just a moment but you know there's a lot of people on there who you know there's gold bugs and then there's people who are you know pro gold and crypto who are looking at like especially the pro crypto people are looking at what's happening in gold and they're reading their own desires into the price action so you've got people saying oh gold is being bid because nobody wants to buy uh, the US sovereign debt and that's because like people don't want their money to be debased and people blah 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 like all this stuff you know and and like I said earlier like it could be it could be that that's the case like it could be that you know that could be a, a true that people don't want to buy uh, US debt anymore they want to put their money in something else um, but that, that's not what's going on here right geopolitical conf conflict on the backs of oversold and overly bearish positioned market uh, after a huge dump is the reason why gold is up uh, if if the war ended this weekend gold would drop 100 bucks easy um, you know so uh, again, like, so I, I still, like, gold is, you know, what gold closed here today at 1980. So gold's 20 bucks away from $2,000. And I think it actually got, it was $3 away from 2000 So could gold get above 2000 this year? Yes. But I'm going to stand by my view that, uh, that gold won't make a new all-time high. And the reason I think so is because I think that, uh, I still think, well, so all the things I just said, if there's a market event out there, I don't think that gold is going to hold up on its own, right? So, the, like, gold, I was saying earlier, gold's reasons for being up are not fundamental. So, why? Real yields are up. So, let me, if I just, I don't know, this is going to take me a minute to find, uh, gosh, real yields, here we are, real yields, up. That's not good for gold, okay? Uh, so there's that. Real yields are up. Uh, recession, I already talked about that earlier. There is not any recession in sight, okay? There's no slowdown in sight right now, okay? And then it's not just that inflation. Like, inflation is kicking up, but it's not just that inflation is up. Uh, it, like, inflation going up doesn't actually necessarily mean gold is going to go up because inflation was going up in 2022, and look what gold did for all of 2022 after the war spike again similar situation oops similar situation as uh as uh, what we were oh, shoot similar situation as what we were talking about before okay uh you know like gold spikes on geopolitical conflict but be, but the fundamentals are still not there so gold gives all of it back right plus more okay so there's that um monetary debasement Okay, maybe, like, maybe we could argue that, but if I pull up my liquidity charts, like, global liquidity has been going down basically most of the year after an initial spike at the beginning of the year. It's, it's made lower lows versus October of last year, right? And U.S. liquidity, while it has had periodic spikes and stuff like that, it's basically been sideways since March. So there's not liquidity support, Okay. Like anyone who's telling you like currency debasement, like growth of money supply or whatever, like it's just not true, right? There, there's nothing in the data that says that that's true. So without those things happening, like without declining real yields or a recession or monetary debasement, uh, you know, in the absence of, you know, fiscal tightening or like, a, I'm sorry, monetary tightening and stuff like that, um, like the only thing that can drive gold's price to the upside is a geopolitical flight to safety which is what we've got right now eventually that's not going to be an issue anymore now, i don't mean to say that that means the war is going to end this weekend but even if like eventually it's going to get to a point where like there's going to be like no significant war news even if the war is still going on i mean like think about it like gold spiked when we got into the russia ukraine uh war right and it and then it came off and then it kind of went up again and then like but the, I mean, that war has been going on. Like, that war is still going on. And, like, gold still went down over the course of the year. So, like, eventually this is, like, the, the war premium is going to wear off. 
I mean, maybe this is just my like my belief. Like I'm willing to be wrong, but I just don't see like you know, and 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 whatever I think, like I only can trade based on my system. So, you know, like if if gold goes over 2075, is that going to mean I'm going to lose tons of money? No, because I don't short things based on what I think. I short or long based on. I don't usually short very much anyway, but you you trade based on your systems, right? Uh, so. Like, you know, I know that if, if price does make an all-time high this year, like, I know someone's going to reach out and try to troll me and be like, oh, see, you're a loser. But, you know, like, show me a process. Show me how you knew that this was going to happen, right? Other than just whatever assumptions that you have about the monetary system and about, about the world, right? Uh, so I, I just don't see it happening. Like, I, I think we get another, you know, like what happened earlier this year, uh, on the last panic where we got gold up, 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 kind of chopping, 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 and then started to sell off. Uh, that's what I think is going to happen. Now, Bitcoin, you know, for all that's going on in Bitcoin, it's not doing a flight to safety thing because if it was, we would have seen it spike much more quickly and rapidly as it did at the end of March, right? Which that wasn't, a lot of people called that flight to safety. That wasn't flight to safety. That was that was uh, monetary or liquidity injections, which Bitcoin likes. Uh, this is a similar situation where Bitcoin should be tracking liquidity better, but it's not. It's actually appreciating despite the fact that liquidity is moving sideways. Uh, so, um, you know, it's, it's not acting like safe haven. If it was acting like safe haven, uh, then in 2022, when the Russia-Ukraine war happened, then it would have spiked along with gold, but it didn't. So... Uh, so there's that. Uh, there was the ETF news that we got this big spike on. Um, the positioning in Bitcoin is super long. Um, and so like as far as CME futures are concerned, I know Bitcoin is a much like more decentralized market than that. But still, uh, you know, people are jumping in right now because they're anticipating the ETF. There's been a lot of news that, oh, the ETF is actually going to come this year. It's going to come sooner. Uh, maybe. But again, like th there's... Right now, I, I don't see this as being a sustainable move, at least not, you know, it could go up. Like, I, I have a Bitcoin position, so it's not like I would be sad if it goes up. But, uh, the, again, my qualitative view here is that, like, this isn't, like, a fundamental move. Um, and that that it's, I, I'm not really sure why it's doing it. So, uh, you know, I, I suspect, like, there, I mean, I just, I guess the, the point that I'm going to make is I don't agree with the reasoning that people are giving for why Bitcoin is moving uh, the way that it is. Uh, so, anyway, just thought I'd put that out there. Um, wow, this video is pretty long, so I'm just going to cut it off here. Um, again, be careful. Uh, the next week is high risk. Uh, and I would also be careful about FOMOing into uh, gold uh, or Bitcoin at this particular juncture. Because, again, without a process, without a system, the risk to reward, at least on any tradable time frame, uh, is really not there anymore, if it was at all. So uh, just keep that in mind. I uh, hope you guys have a great weekend. See you guys next time.